catch I, I want to let's just start with you know as we you know I, I started with catch talking about the goods and the bad of where the Texas is you know right now three and oh can't deny where, where they are as far as that the defense for sure has been playing particularly well uh and I want to you know some things that we, we know we can check the box to right but then there's some other stuff that becomes a little bit of the trickier things as Texas gets ready to start some conference play and I want to start with Quinn you know because I don't want to hide away and run away from that that the subject like and again I'm been standing on the, that table for him uh, just pat you know the past couple of years, but it wasn't a good performance you know for him or the offense you know this past weekend. And I don't I don't I the thing about you and I I think is you know we try to keep it as as, as a buck as we can, and we're not just going to piss on you know have someone piss on your leg and tell you that it's raining. Um, this team can't go to where it needs to go catch without Quinn looking like the Alabama Quinn as opposed to what we saw against Wyoming. Is that a fair assessment? Probably. Like, yeah. I mean, I I think that, yes. Uh, Fair. (laughs) Yes. Got more? Well, yeah, I just think the thing that we need to – there are two – the two major question marks – about this team, I think, coming into the season centered around Quinn Ewers and Steve Sarkeesian. And sometimes they go hand in hand. I thought there was a bigger Sarkeesian problem on Saturday night than there was a Quinn Ewers problem, although Quinn was a little erratic. He threw some balls high. He threw some balls behind. He had a game that, quite frankly, he'd probably like to have all over again. He'd love to go out and and do that again. It wasn't anywhere near at the level that we saw against Alabama. And yet I'm reminded, and I, I I think I feel like I need to remind everybody, Quinn Ewers is in his second season as a starter, and he hasn't even started a full 12-game season's worth of games. He is a player who is still developing. He is still a guy. It's funny because Saturday night we had this conversation about a week ago had we asked the question, Will he ever have a bad game again, thinking that maybe there's only 10 or 11 games left? You admitted on Saturday night that you would have said defiantly, no, we're beyond that point. I think Saturday was a reminder that there will probably still be days like this before this season is over. There will be highs and there may be some lows. And I think that's on the Quinn side. I feel like his, his, I feel like Steve Sarkeesian did not help his young quarterback out on Saturday uh, with a game plan that Sarkeesian ad- admits after the game kind of flew by the wayside because Wyoming came out in a defense they weren't prepared to see. And apparently, like, that's enough to throw Steve Sarkeesian off his game. Uh, it was a poor game offensively. I think the two things somewhat go hand in hand. One guy's in his ninth, 10th year as as a head coach. The other guy is a second year sophomore who hasn't started a full 12 game season in his career yet. I don't think he started 12 games in his career. He's close. Uh, Maybe this weekend will be number 12. I'm trying to think how many games he missed last season. Maybe he's officially at 12 now, but I I just, I think we need to prepare ourselves that Quinn Ewers is still going to have some occasional games where he's not at the Alabama level. I think his coach needs to pick him up. I think the team needs to pick him up. I think not all of those things happened on Saturday, which is one of the reasons we saw a 10-10 game going into the fourth quarter. Yeah, it's interesting because it's the second time, you know, that he's, you know, said like we've seen something that they they had to put on tape. But catch that the interesting part about that conversation though, catch is that but it's not the first time you've seen it in your life, right? I mean, it's like it's not the first time you saw like a three three five and thought you and you said like this is new. Like, where does this come from? Like, the, when you start seeing it, there should be. It, it seems like there should be a quicker adjustment to what's out there, as loads what seems to be a, a usually like a slower adjustment to what's out there. And like to your point, it's kind of like. 
it's almost like he's playing it safe at that point and saying, okay, well, this is different. Let me just do some safe plays. But then some of the plays that he did, like you talked about some of the, the play calling, then it was like some wild plays, like Xavier Worthy getting getting us something and he's about to pass it to Quinn Ewers. And you're like, is that necessary? Or, you know, it's it's almost like, like to your point, it, it seems like it does get thrown off just a little bit. And it's a little surprising for, you know, offensive mind who – Everyone says it's got this great offensive mind that for at least three quarters he was thrown off. And it really took really what it took is a defensive explosion to put this game away because had that not happened, I mean, the Xavier Worthy thing happens, but it really took the defense kind of stepping up, getting the three and outs, getting the pick sixes, those things to put it away. Um you got anything more? Any more thoughts in your head as relates to the Sark and three three five and and in game adjustments? Well, let's start with the three three five thing. Like now, it's a thing. I mean, people on Orange Bloods are talking about it. I'm seeing it on social media. It says it, it, the, the 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 new thing is man. If you throw a three three five with the three safety look at Sark, the other Texas is going to struggle. And it's funny because if you look at the results at Texas, yes. If you look, for instance, you know, think about what they did against Arkansas in 2021 when now was the 335 really the issue, or was the issue that like Arkansas manhandled Texas? I mean, I think we reinvent these narratives so that they fit whatever we're trying to discuss in the moment. I don't remember coming out of the Arkansas game in 2021 and thinking to myself, man. That scheme was something else. Yeah. The previous year, he faced against the same scheme while he was at Alabama. And I think he beat it 52-3. to I'd have to go back and look at how bad of an ass-kicking he gave Barry Odom uh, that night when, when he had NFL-level quarterback, NFL-level receivers, NFL-level talent. So I feel like the scheme thing, this 3-3-5 thing, look, when you have a great quarterback and great talent and it all hits – the scheme, who you're, the scheme you're playing against matters a lot less. It really is about the Jimmys and the Joes more so than the X's and the O's. Uh, I, I think that Saturday was a little bit of everything coming together. It looked, this is, this entire season is a referendum on Steve Sarkeesian as a head coach. They're third in the nation in the AP. The expectation is they have the third best chances according to ESPN's FPI index, whatever. That to make it to the to the to the playoffs. Yeah. So expectations are high. That would not have worked. That that performance on Saturday would not have been good enough against a better team. But you know, when when we go back to why why did why did I pick nine and three at the beginning of the season? It wasn't the schedule. It was because <laughs> what we know about Steve Sarkeesian after watching him for a couple of seasons and looking at his career as a head coach he's going to have some games like this he's going to have some coaching performances like this he's going to have some excuses after games where it's like oh well we saw something that we weren't prepared for so you mean you got out coached and that's what that means the other team did something we weren't ready for and then we didn't respond well to it translation we got out coached and one of the things that can't happen as this team gets into conference play, uh, plays against slightly better teams in Wyoming. That was a Wyoming team playing with its backup quarterback, who, to be fair, I, th I thought threw some nice Good. balls. I thought through, through three quarters of that game, Anwar, the backup quarterback, Savota, Savota, I thought he was better than Quinn Ewers in that game. And we really can't say that Quinn changed his performance much in the fourth quarter. He threw one pass to Xavier Worthy, who turned into Tyreek Hill, the college version. And that play really broke. That game was screaming for Texas to make one play to put the pressure on Wyoming, and then they would crack. And that's mm -hmm. pretty much what happened. It just took a long time for Texas to get to that one play. They don't get the ball to Jatavion Sanders at all. He gets a donut in that game from a reception standpoint. It took a while to even get Xavier Worthy going. They weren't taking a week ago. Sarkeesian said the key to this offense, we got to make teams scared of us. We have to take shots. Sarkeesian told us after the opener, he doesn't even care if 
They don't complete the deep shots. Yeah, they have to right. take them. They have to be aggressive. All yeah, gas, right. no breaks. And then you look at what happened on Saturday. Sark let Wyoming force Texas into a very small passing game box. And they stayed inside that passing game box. And they weren't real successful with it. And it's ironic that and, – and, and where I call out Sark getting out coached for three quarters – I give him a lot of credit on the touchdown pass to Worthy. That's the first time this season they've thrown a ball and that's at that spot of the field. They hadn't mm-hmm. gone to the right side of the field with a ball behind the line of scrimmage the entire season. So they went against their own the, – the scouting report on Sark in this offense would have told Wyoming they aren't going to do that. And for 11 quarters this season, they hadn't. But when they needed a play, I'll give Sark credit, he went against the scouting report on Texas. He went against their own tendencies and went completely the other direction. And it helped create the play that ultimately decided the game. Catch, you had a really good uh, graphic in there. How do you feel about it? Was, it was obviously on Orange Woods. How do you feel about Aaron putting that graphic on the screen? Do you want that? Let's uh, go for it. Okay, all right, Aaron, can you work on what that that graphic there? Because Ketch had that thing, and it would give you a little bit of an insight uh, into some of the things when you started talking about Orange Bloods and signups and all these other kind of things, like some of the things that you get uh, that you don't necessarily get in the general public. So, Ke- as as Aaron's working on that, I'll use that as an opportunity while we need to talk about Rogue Shop using that promo code orangebloods.com, the rogueshop.com. It's it's a thing that Ketch and I uh, have liked, and, and boy, I needed I needed some Rogue products last night, Ketch. First of all, went to see Austin, a, 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 Austin FC, so I needed something. Oh, you went to, to the game last night? Oh, you I needed did go to the Rogue. Game last night. I definitely needed Rogue. <laughs> I'm just, again, again, again with this. So I definitely needed that, but... Get, so I feel I feel a lot better. Like I was able to get a good, good night of sleep. So Rogue helped with that. Catch has got his his stuff there, but it, all the stuff, the salves, the everything. Richard, his lovely wife, they do a fantastic job over there. So make sure you check out RogueShop.com. Uh, use that. Wake and bake. Let <laughs> let use that promo code Orange Blood <laughs> and it go, we'll go from there. Um, it's interesting, catch as, as Aaron's working on the graphic. And Aaron, just let me know when you got it ready. So take your time. Don't don't feel like you need to rush. Um, <coughs> you know, catch we. You know, the, when you when they face the three three five, the, the the key to that is that you got to be able to run the ball. I mean, Hard just said it in the in the catch. Mike Hard is not to be confused with. It's just, it's a plural, but Mike Hard is. Um, you know, he but you got to be able to run the ball. And it's it was interesting in that game that. They didn't commit to the run until it was late. You know, late in the game is when they decided, like, all right, this is what's going to happen. It's kind of interesting. Like, it's like Baylor last, you know, last year when he finally decided, you know, I guess we're going to do this thing. And it's interesting that you, it's it, it's very interesting. And I don't know if you have a thought or a theory or anything. Uh, but okay, let's get the graphic ready, uh, and I'll come back to the, the running thing. Catch, you want to break this down here and explain to everybody what they're seeing on the screen? Well, look, this is from Pro Football Focus. This is a passing map of everything that Ewers has done this season. I actually looks like this is just the game map. I'm so if we were looking at a season map, you would see that down here that one for one for 44 yards and a touchdown. That's the only time they've thrown that ball. If you have it set up on your screen, that far right bottom corner is where they threw that ball to Xavier Worthy. Now, this is the game map. This in itself tells an interesting story that I'll get to in just a second. But this one for one for 44 yards, that's the only time they've thrown that pass in that quadrant on the right side all season long. And Texas is a very middle to left dominant team. So... And as you can see, they only threw the ball outside the numbers to the right three times in the ball game. Uh, they were two of three, to be fair, on those passes. If you look at the map as a whole, if you go all the way to the outside left, to the far left, you'll see that Texas threw two passes. They went deep once to the outside left, and then they threw a pass between zero and 10 yards 
uh, if I'm not mistaken, that also was to Xavier Worthy. If you'll remember, if you think about the play, the touchdown play is a one-on-one play for Worthy. He makes that catch. He's got to beat one guy, and then it's a big play. If you go back and think of the ball to the outside left, they lined up in twins to the outside left. They threw that ball to Worthy. A.D. Mitchell actually makes a really uh, – Adonai Mitchell, excuse yes, me, makes right. a really good block. One of the first ones I think we've seen from him for most of the season. It also – so it left Worthy in a situation where he's one-on-one, kind of the same play as the touchdown, except Worthy got pinned to the sideline and wasn't able to really – do a whole lot, but conceptually it's the same. Texas lives on the left side a lot. Quinn Ewers is a middle to left passing quarterback. It's where he he's way more comfortable going middle to left than he is to the right. What's interesting about the numbers from Saturday night was almost everything was directed between the numbers. Uh, you know, they two they, they throw two balls to the right, to the left. They throw three balls to the right. The other 16 passes that night between the numbers, which my interpretation of this is that Wyoming was able to force Texas into a small box. So when you've got better athletes, when you've got better players, you want to be able to use the entire field. What Wyoming was able to force Texas to do was play its passing game in a box from mostly from the line of scrimmage up to about 20 yards. And I mean, if you're Wyoming, that's perfect because the area of the field that you have to be responsible for and defend becomes much smaller. The whole purpose of going deep, stretching your opponent out, making them fearful of, using the entire field is that you want to open up space. You don't want it to be clogged up Saturday night. They played in a phone booth, if you will. I mean, the majority, the majority of their passing game out of 21 passes, 10 of them came in the middle of the field between the numbers from zero to 20 yards. And Texas did well with the short stuff. You can see four of six for 25 yards and a touchdown. You know, that's a it's a 114.6 NFL rating, um, which is really good. But then, man, you get to that zero to 20 yards. They were one out of four for 16 yards. If you look at what they were from 10 yards and beyond in the passing game, they were one of nine on the night for 30 yards. So the passing game just was dysfunctional. And it, and it wasn't the Texas offense that we saw against Alabama. And Anwar, for me, this comes down to when you're the better team with better players and better athletes, you have to dictate the terms of the game. And what seemed to happen is that Wyoming came out in a defense that Texas wasn't completely prepared for. But as you said at the top, it ain't like (laughs) Sarkeesian has never seen this before. Not only has has he seen the 3-3-5 with the three safety look, He's seen it with better players. He's seen teams yeah. that have used this defense with with NFL guys, and yet it felt like Sark. It felt like it kind of got in Sarkeesian's head a little bit. I think some people might feel like those words are a little too strong, but even Sarkeesian after the game came out and and questioned himself and said, "Look, nobody's harder on me than me. Nobody's harder on the staff than I am." And he came out of the game questioning. The re- double reverse to Xavier Worthy on third and one, and then the play right. I mean, he 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 came out as soon as the game was over and said, "There's a handful of plays. I, I already questioned myself. I should have done a better job." I think he will go back and look at the film and really question what they did a lot. Because if I'm looking at these numbers, he's going to see the same thing. He's going to he's going to see we didn't stretch the field. We didn't get our best players involved. Um, I didn't do a good job of getting my best players the ball in places they could make plays. We never saw Texas really test Wyoming and stretch them with their athletes. And I just think this has to be the good thing for Texas. It's awesome to learn a lesson in a game that you win. What sucks 
is when you learn a lesson that costs you a game. On paper, in theory, there should be a lesson for the rest of the season from what happened on Saturday night. And, you know, I think the big question is, will Steve Sarkeesian learn from this lesson or will we get into games on the road later in the year or games against tougher opponents where he and the offense are forced out of their comfort zone and what, the moment they're forced out of a comfort zone, they stop executing at all? Because it wasn't a good offensive performance. Although, look, Wyoming did some, Wyoming kept the ball for a long time. So when you look at the second and third quarters on war, Wyoming kept the ball offensively. I think that played a part in some of the inability for Texas to get into a rhythm. I don't think this is something we need to overreact to. I just think we need to be able to look at what happened and go, okay, that happened. Can't really let that happen a whole bunch this season. Like, okay, it happened against Wyoming at home. Let you win by three touchdowns. Sark's just got to be able to adjust better on the fly than he did on Saturday. And it is one of the knocks on him in his career when he's allowed to run his script, when he's able to – with mo- we see it early in games throughout his career how good the offense looks – And then sometimes that changes. It's been a little weird because in the second, it's been the second half of games this season where the offense has really found itself, which is different than what we've seen in the past. But the moral is still the same. When when Sarkeesian has to go to a, he's like a relief pitcher that's got a fastball. He's throwing a hundred on war, but major league hitters can hit a hundred once they've had time to time it, once they've seen it once. Like they'll start hitting that hundred miles an hour and you got to have a secondary pitch. And yeah. Steve Sarkeesian was like a major league pitcher on Saturday that didn't have a good secondary pitch and it made being effective for him really difficult. And that's just, he's better than that. It just in, in future games this season, that can't happen because if Sarkeesian is off, it's hard to expect that his quarterback's going to be on. Well, and to, and to and add to, to your analogy, it's like he, he has that 100-mile-per-hour fastball and the, the batter is just bunting. Yes. And he's, and he's like – and he's not bringing the infield in. You he's know like, we I mean? didn't even practice covering bunts this week. What am I going to do? <laughs> exactly. That's, that's what it boils down to. Like, they're just bunting, they're bunting, they're bunting. He's like, man – I, should we bring the infield in? It's like <laughs> we didn't even. I didn't practice once this week with the infield up. What are we gonna do? Yeah, and you're like, oh, you should adjust. That's that's what it does, and that's what what good teams do. Um, I, and I gotta ask, catch this because there's a couple of things coming out of that that it was going down in my mind. Because so, thank you for the breakdown, and I hope the hopefully you use that again with your show for your audience as well today, uh, because I think that's really good information. You know, it's I'm, it's it's again, it's overreaction Monday. Catch is what we do. So it's this Texas sits here three and zero, right? You can't deny that t- number three in the country. The question to you though, catch is, do you know how good Texas is? And here's why I ask that. We talk. This is ten to ten going into the fourth quarter against Wyoming with their backup quarterback. To your point, was it the worst quarterback in the world? He actually threw a pretty good ball. It, it, he actually learns how to, on third downs, actually throw beyond the sticks as below beneath it. <laughs> he might, maybe there's been different results for him down the line, right? But so there, but he, he didn't. He's not the reason they, that they lost. Texas obviously opens up the season with a win against Rice, but that thing was like you know what, 16 points for them at halftime, you know. And, and against again, sure we could say Rice isn't that bad of a team. But there's still rice, right? At the end of the day, like you, no one's going to give you an, an award for beating Rice in Wyoming. They beat Alabama, and as I talked about in the, in the opener, you know, USF's not a really good team. USF's not a good, really, good, really good program as, as it is. And maybe, maybe I look back and say USF was better, right? Then what? But there's still USF, all right. But, and, my, and I say we because that's the school I graduated from. Not even a real conference. I mean, we're in a conference, but it is what it is. Not a real I feel like this has turned into a South Florida, like you know, therapy session for you. Well, no, not no. even that good. Not in a good yeah. conference. It's okay. 
you got you should if I didn't do this show, I would tell you give me the South Florida rival site for for a hobby. <laughs> just 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 so I could be bored and just rant over there for all 10 people that maybe subscribe. So then we look at it, it's three and oh against three teams that we just don't know how how to really feel feel about them. I, do you have a, a good grasp of how good Texas really is at, at this moment, or is it hard to know? As Stupsify will say, how good any team is at this at this moment. Well, I think Stupsify makes a good point. Look, there's nothing going on with Texas right now that's not going on with almost every team in the top ten. I mean, Georgia fans today are like, look, we were losing fourteen to three to an unranked South Carolina team. How good are we really? Florida State goes on the road to Boston College. Again, a non-ranked team finds itself at a 31-29 game that could have gone a different direction. A lot of people look at that game and say, if Boston College could have just stopped committing fouls, 18 <laughs> they, penalties. They, in they that have, game. How many penalties? Are they like 18 or something? Yeah, like that? 18 penalties. Yeah. yeah. You know, they're saying, well, as good as we were against LSU, we could have lost to Boston College. A Michigan kind of had a game similar to Texas this weekend where they're in a tight game at halftime and it took time for them to separate Ohio state a week ago scored 35 points at home. And people were saying things like this isn't the typical Ohio state team. They're not just battering opponents. We're a quarter of the way through the season and every team, but Washington has in the top 10 has a performance, at least one that makes you go, Hmm, how good are they really? I think it's a year in college football where we've yet no dominant team has emerged this early in the season. Maybe Georgia will be that team by the end of the season. Maybe Texas will be that team by the end of the season. I think there are candidates all over the place, but nobody is that team yet. So in proper context, Texas fans and everybody should probably chill a little bit in the sense that, there are about 128 teams across the country that would trade places with Texas right now and take take Texas's problems over their own. I yeah. think that the reality is, well, if we peel the, the Band-Aid back a little bit, you got a coach you don't completely know if he's really elite at this thing, at being a head coach. You've got a quarterback that's still developing, and Mama always said there would be an occasional day like this. And I think the thing that Wyoming banked on in, 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 in going to a defense they hadn't showed all season, I think they felt like we can get our front six guys, maybe sometimes bring a safety down into the box. We can stop the Texas running game. And if the 3-3-5 changes what Texas does from a passing game standpoint because it changes who Sark is, then it's about our defense against that run game that Texas has. And look, we went into the game asking, will this be a game that Sarkeesian tries to run the ball a lot because conference play starts next season? And that is, with all due respect to that seven-minute drive against Alabama at the end of the game, it's a part of the offense that's still a major work in progress. So what is Texas? It's a team that's still trying to figure out who they are at, in the running game. It's got a quarterback that's still developing. It's got a head coach that's still developing. Uh, it has a great defense. And it's really good on special teams. And you add all of that up together, and you kind of got Saturday night. The defense did its part. They gave up one big play. But other than that, they shut Wyoming down for the most part. You know, Wyoming scores 10 points. So – how mad at the defense can you really get? Yeah. The offense has issues that they're still working on. And I I think what we can't let happen is that the Alabama game somehow changes the fact that all of those other truths are no longer truths when they still are. If Texas struggles to run the football and you're going up against a good defense, you know, those teams may give Quinn Ewers a tough time because – Again, Texas had the terms dictated to it on Saturday night on top of these other issues, and that's how a 10-10 game happens. Yeah, that does that 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 does happen. You know, it's interesting too, catch I'll go and look back and you know, look, I was just like you were talking, 
I look back to TCU, you know, last year, and you know they beat the Colorado thirteen to thirty eight to thirteen to beat Tarleton. They had that close game versus SMU, you know, forty two to thirty four. Um, and then, you know, they beat OU, but then they have, you know, they have a lot of close ones. It's a Kansas one was by a touchdown. Oklahoma State goes into double overtime. Kansas State was by 10. You know, West Virginia, Texas, Texas by 10, barely getting by, past the Texas. They beat Baylor by one point. Uh, you know, they dominate, obviously, in the Iowa State game and lose in the, in the Big 12 championship game. So, you, you just sometimes to your point, Catch, sometimes these games are, are close. The one the, the good part, though, I will say, uh, Catch, is that as it relates to, to Quinn in that conversation, one good – I don't say one good thing, but a good thing that he's doing extremely well is he's, been, he's being careful with the football. Yeah. I, and, and, the, and, you know, I, I looked at – I was just looking it up. There's 22 mm-hmm. quarterbacks – uh, with you know that maybe haven't played an A game or more. I wish I could have had more time to look it up. But he's he's in, he's one of twenty two that haven't thrown an interception this season of the ninety uh, quarterbacks that are listed on on CFP stats. So, ball, be, protecting the ball and not being able to put them in a bad situation. I mean, Jay, I think Jaden's blues his fumble was the first time Texas offense turned over the ball this season. Uh, if I if I'm correct on that one, so. Um, from from not turning the ball over, I think that's one thing. If you're Texas, you can say to yourself, "Hey, that's something to be excited about. That's something to build on." Because you know, you you have a couple turnovers in some of these games, and all of a sudden, it's a lot closer. You know, for, the for these fourth quarters can't happen, second halves can't happen if Quinn is reckless with the ball. I agree. Look, I, I've written about this, so I don't disagree with the point that Quinn. The one thing that you can kind of, and I've been talking about this since August, whatever you wanted to say about viewers in the offense and what they didn't do against the Texas defense in scrimmages, the big headlines coming out of most of the big events from the Texas camp didn't include viewers just turning the ball over, which is what we were hearing a year ago when he was competing with Hudson Card. It was like, ugh, viewers can still make a play that, you know, he trusts his arm a little too much or something something along those lines. He is taking care of the ball. I mean, more times than not this season, he's not putting the ball in a dangerous place at all. It does need to be said he should have been intercepted on Saturday in the end zone. Um, if you want to know why defensive backs are defensive backs instead of wide receivers, look at what happened with that Wyoming safety uh, when he comes across the middle and Ewers never saw him and he gets both hands on the ball. I mean, ultimately what Ewers did was threw into double coverage into the end zone. I think he was going to Sanders on that play. If I'm not mistaken, I'm just trying to remember um, it happened. I thought he threw it a couple of times. If you think about now, he throws a ball to Gunner Helm along the, it was one of the few times they kind of went vertical. They go, they go vertical right. And the ball he throws to Gunner Helm is exquisite. <laughs> it was such a beautiful throw. The only problem is there were three defenders over there, and one of the defenders rattled Helm as soon as the ball made contact in his hands to break up the play. He threw that ball into double, maybe even triple coverage on that play, certainly double coverage. Um, so there were a couple of throws on Saturday that I would describe as dangerous. Like I said, should have been intercepted, but to your larger point, I think one of the things that this team can bank on is that he doesn't do that very often. I mean, it didn't happen against Alabama at all. I don't really remember it happening against rice. Now things that have happened and they put the ball on the ground a few times with the skill position guys. We've seen Sanders put the ball on the ground. We saw them. It, it happened twice against Alabama, and there were a couple of other plays that were close. It wasn't an issue on Saturday. You can you can kind of write off Jaden Blue uh, and his fumble because when C.J. Baxter comes back, well, not even when C.J. Baxter comes back, Steve Sarkeesian did not play Jaden Blue very much on Saturday on a night when they were trying to establish a run game, it's clear that Blue's a distant third. 
I only bring all this up because from a ball security standpoint with the skill guys, you know, they're playing with fire a little bit. They got really lucky against Alabama that the times they put the ball on the ground or the times yeah. that they did, but then they got caught. They got, they got kind of got, got out of dodge without that being an issue. You know, you go in a game this week, this weekend against Baylor, you're better than them. They're terrible at quarterback. Texas should smoke Baylor all by a lot. But, look, maybe Baylor does something defensively that Steve Sarkeesian has never seen before or hasn't seen in three weeks and suddenly can't quite function the same way that he would otherwise. Maybe your quarterback is in a little bit of a rut and trying to find his way. Maybe the other team makes a few plays on offense and then you turn the ball over. When people say things like, who on this schedule could Texas possibly lose to? It's not about the opponent as much as what Texas does against the opponent. And I think Saturday was a perfect example of that. If the offense goes into a rut, defensively, Texas is going to keep them in games. But if you just add a couple of plays, take take seven points away from the offense on that night because the guy does catch the ball in the, in the end zone and intercepts yours. Let's say – there's a big special teams play. There's, you know, it only takes a couple of plays when you're playing poorly for things to go sideways. And against a better team, you could see where that happens where Texas could drop a game. I mean, it's not about the opponent. If if you want to know who Texas loses to, just take what we saw on Saturday and place it in any game moving forward. BYU, Oklahoma on the road at TCU, those games stand out more than any others. But if if Texas struggles in that vein, those you can see where Texas will get themselves in trouble because the they were 10-10 going to the fourth quarter against Wyoming, allowing Wyoming to dictate terms in that game. And I don't think the fourth quarter performance with a pick six – with the play to Worthy, with the long the long run that sets up the Quinn Ewers touchdown run, I don't think that changes the entirety of the game because they played a really good seven minute stretch from the top of the fourth quarter to the middle of it, and then it, the game was over at that point. So that, let me put this in perspective, and I'll get to the super chats in a second. Um, just. You don't have to spend long on this. If if I just want to put this Baylor game in perspective because we talk about potential trip ups down the line, right? If Rice plays Baylor this week, does Rice win? Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. What about Wyoming? If Wyoming plays yes. Baylor this week, they, okay, all right. So you gotta just, keep in mind, look, Blake Shapin is the Baylor starting quarterback. They weren't playing great with him, but now that he's out. And they're having to lean on Sawyer Robertson, who's a transfer in former four-star quarterback from Mississippi State, who's playing at like a D C minus level. They're not a good football team at all. Okay, uh, there was some super chats uh, that came in. It was it, what, two uh, Aaron, I just or just just Buck Wilds. Okay, um, <laughs> but I just went through. I don't know if there's any new millionaires who bet ten dollars on Murphy. Um, getting that TD, you know, first offensive TD. So I know I did it. So uh, that that's a that's a prize picks killer as well. <laughs> when things like that happen, you're like, you know, you're like, come on, come on. There's, there was Xavier, there was Adonai, there was Sanders. My whole oh, weekend that. changes if he throws it on third and five instead of running it into the end zone. I thought the biggest layup all weekend was Ewer's more on the 2.5 passing touchdowns every single thing i had in prize picks was connected to to yours throwing three or more touchdowns against wyoming <laughs> well what you do that, that, that clearly clearly when that didn't happen everything else every other domino fell uh in and not in your favor so here's the thing catch i want to i got one more offensive question and I'll we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk defense, right? I saw Cole Hudson after the game. He was on crutches. Sarkeesian will give us an update this morning. But he didn't look like a guy that's going to play anytime soon. 
He just when you when I see a guy on crutches who's barely moving and barely walking, can, can't put any pressure really on there. You know, since there's certain in, in, injuries that you can still walk afterwards, and and the fact that he couldn't walk, I was like, he ain't playing against Bailey. Just, it looks like a multi-week injury. You just hope it's not a multi-month injury. But correct. Correct. He's gonna. He's. I would be shocked if he plays on Saturday. So it's DJ yes. Campbell's job. Yes. The question I, I I'm asking you is, does Neto need to get a look at no. all in your book in mind? No. I think the same thing that we say about Quinn Ewers. You got to say about some of these young offensive linemen, especially DJ Campbell, who is really the only new starter on that offensive line, he's going to have an occasional, what the fuck was that play? Like he just is. He's a young guy. They are not all Kelvin Banks where as soon as you put him out there, you just never notice that he really never has any bad plays. Uh, DJ Campbell was the best offensive lineman on the field against Alabama. And then he certainly wasn't that on Saturday against Wyoming, but that's going to be part of his development. And at some point, you hope this season, the consistency starts to kick in and you start to see him playing towards at least his median level game in and game out with some occasional highs. What we saw on on, on Saturday was that teams are going to try to confuse DJ Campbell. Occasionally, that's going to work. The thing is, what are you going to replace him with? Another young, inexperienced player who's got to go through the exact same thing that DJ Campbell does. Like, it'd be different if they had one older guy on the offensive line. Let's say Carrick sticks uh, had stuck around for another year, and I don't think they wanted to play him. I don't know. I'm trying to think if there was a Christian Jones version, maybe even like a Tope Amade when he was a senior. I mean – I don't know if they had one experienced guy to lean on from a depth standpoint, maybe you, you could do that, but like, this is what they have. Everybody behind Campbell is even more inexperienced than he is. Yeah. So you just got to learn. They're going to have to live with the occasional mistake by DJ Campbell uh, and bake that into their game plans. Look, probably like two or three times DJ Campbell is going to have a bust it didn't happen against Alabama, but it did on Saturday against Wyoming. They have nobody better. They have nobody more experienced. They have nobody that's more ready to play. I mean, at some point, you just got to trust that Kyle Flood actually does know what he's working with with his group of guys. And I just don't think they have a better option. You know, it, it's funny because at times last year, we would say, <laughs> they got to have a better option than Cole Hudson. And then they would put DJ Campbell into the game and there'd be a couple of big busts. And it would be like, oh, like maybe, yeah. maybe the answer is we don't have a good right guard and it, it's going to take some time for those young guys to grow up. And I just think that's the reality facing Texas. I got a, I got a small question catch and then I got a bigger picture one. Okay. Small, smaller question is after the game, Sark may mention that they were, you know, this there were so many fans were talking about the win to him against Bama and how you know they people were still focused in on this thing. And he started saying that, yeah, well, he felt like maybe so that was the kind of thing that he almost alluded to that kind of bled a little bit into the to, to the locker room. But all week long, catch all we heard was about how this team is dialed in. They like, literally had a players' meeting to talk about. Yes. Let's stay focused. <laughs> so and then, and then jobs not finished by Kobe. That that was a thing, right? And then and so and then afterwards, he starts talking about what the fans are saying. Now, catch fans are allowed. Fans don't have to focus. I, I always say this when when coaches say focus, that doesn't that applies to your team. Fan, anyone, anyone here in the chat, if they want to focus in on Baylor, and Oklahoma, want to, hey, we want to start talking about the Oklahoma game, game today. Like, <laughs> it's not our, it's a, it's a, it's not our job to focus. I'm just kind of curious as, as you like are about 48 hours removed from that. I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on, on that whole, we were focused, but not, but the fans aren't focused, and then we weren't focused. I'm, I was just – it threw, threw me off just a little bit. Maybe I, I didn't think, think their focus was an issue. I, I actually hated to hear that from Sarkeesian 
Um, if they, they weren't, I mean, look, there were, and, and he tried to point out the pre-snap penalties were an indication that they weren't focused. I think that discredits a huge portion of the team that didn't have a focus issue. The defense didn't have a focus issue. You know what their issue was on the first drive of the game? They played a freshman. Anthony Hill is in the David Bendis spot on that long touchdown run. He took a false step, got sucked into traffic, and suddenly there was no running back I and mean, there was no linebacker to fill the gap on the that that running back just runs right through for 68 yards. That wasn't a focus issue. That was a execution issue. Yeah. You, and, and and you know what didn't happen? Anthony Hill didn't play in that spot as kind of a holding you know, three down line. I mean, it, they weren't using him to pressure at that point. They were using him in the traditional sense of how they would use David Benda at linebacker. And he had a screw up. It happens. I mean, again, a lot of what we're talking about today, this is still a, a team fairly young. We've yeah. talked about the quarterback is young and still developing. We're talking about the right guard is young and still developing. We're talking about a true freshman linebacker playing in the ninth quarter of his career on Saturday, they gave him a little bit extra responsibility. Said, what does it look like when you run with the first team defense and not just a pressure player on passing downs? And he had a he had him bust. It happens. I thought the defense played really well. I thought the special teams executed. I thought the offense struggled, and we've outlined where those were, but I thought Quinn Ewers' issue was an execution issue. I didn't think uh, Quinn and, – and you know what? To that point, Quinn Ewers in the fourth quarter, he and Jalen Ford were the two players that got the team together, huddled them up, gave them the rah-rah speech, and they come out and, 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 and score 21 points in the fourth quarter and close the game off. I don't think it was a focus issue. I think it was an execution issue. And it is Steve Sarkeesian's job – to have a team that executes better. And I think it's easy to say there was a focus problem. I just, I don't, who? Because it wasn't the entire team. You can't tell me that a defense that only really allowed one bust and then they got nickeled and nickeled, not even nickeled and dime. They got nickeled and nickeled over the field a little bit, but they were in, they did their job. So look, I don't think this thing's that big of a deal. I think if you're Texas and you're a really good football team, which they appear to be, you go put your pants, you put your big boy pants, you come to practice today, you come ready, and you make adjustments both as a coaching staff and as a group of players. You learn from your mistakes. Um, I don't think what we saw on Saturday is going to be something that we see a lot this season. I don't think this offense is going to be a problem like it was on yeah. Saturday. But – you know, they have this in them. And I think the thing that Texas fans just need to remember is that coming out of the Alabama game, they looked at the remaining 10 games and they said, who on earth can stay within 20 points of us on this schedule? Yeah. What they aren't baking in, it's still a young team. They're still working it out as players, as a group. Uh, and my, and there will be days when they're not the high wire circus act on offense. And the good news on those days, they do have a really badass defense that should ensure that games don't get away from them. But you know, like, look what happens when Quinn Ewers, if and when he has a two interception quarter. I mean, it can happen. And I think Texas fans talk themselves coming out of the game last week, that there were certain things that would just never happen to this team. And I would say there's a reason why I picked this team to go nine and three. I don't think they're going to finish nine and three, but there are reasons why I thought they would. And they were scattered all over the place on Saturday. Um, let me do a couple more. Just one, one kind of last big picture one. Uh, and then I got to roll down to uh, Sark and get ready. Of course, I told you I'm rolling on a spare tire, so I got to roll really slowly. Unfortunately, can't roll past 50. Um, we are right now, catch crazy as it sounds, we are fourth of the way through the season. I know, 
I mean, it's it's how it goes. Three. It feels like it takes forever to get here, and then it goes like that. <laughs> exactly. It's like Christmas Day. So um, if we had to do an audit, and I'm asking you to audit this team, give me the areas that you feel like that checks the boxes for you, and you say, I've got it, whether it's areas or, or players or anything to that effect. Give me what's checking the boxes in your audit, and then give me where there should be, you know, lack of better terms, a little bit of concern or areas where, uh, you know, not not so good. I think defensively they check all the boxes for me. Um, it's a deeper unit than I thought because they're playing so many young players, but those young players are playing well. The Anthony Hill play on the touchdown run excluded. Um and look, there were probably other players that could have made plays there too. But if you go back and watch that play, you can see where the failure to execute occurred. Um, look, coach, head head coach, still developing quarterback, still developing running game, still developing interior off part of the offensive line. That's it. That's it. I think otherwise, this team is ready to win a Big Twelve championship. They're still the favorites in the Big 12. Uh, they're still one of the best teams on the country. They're still, they have either the best or the second best win in the country. Although maybe, maybe Utah's win over Florida, where they batter Florida with their backup quarterback at home, but against yeah. a Florida team that took out Tennessee this weekend, you know, I mean, we're quibbling, but there are there are three teams in the country that have badass wins: Florida State, Utah, and Texas. So yeah. Texas has got a resume that they're building. Uh, I think they've got a defense that they can lean on. Their special teams are better than maybe I thought they would. Ryan Sanborn, I apologize for questioning whether or not you were the punter that Texas should have gone after. He's averaging almost 10 yards more per punt right now through three games at Texas than he did last season and for most, most of his career at Stanford. He's been unbelievable. Yes. But, you know, the things that we saw on Saturday are things that can pop back up during the season. If I'm auditing these team, this team, it's the stuff from Saturday. And if, if and when they clean that stuff up, they won't have a lot of problems on the field this season. Yeah, I'm, with you, Catch, I think for me, the defense is checks all boxes. You know, for me, I, I, I look at that and I'm able to see, you know, a, you know, it's you know, it's crazy that he's, he mentions that, you know, you know, Sorrell, you know, kind of has a, a big game because we're like, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a guy who, we, you know, we thought probably have double digit sacks as, uh, you know, the endorsement for the Rogue Shop uh, is right there. RogueShop.com, promo code Orange Bloods. <laughs> Wait a minute. You all right, Cash? Every once in a while. That was, that was a big one, man. That it was, was a big, big one. one. It was. Thank ever. you, Richard. I, look, it's a birthday Richard, cake. Ro, no, oh no, it is uh, <coughs> gelato. Yeah, here it's this. Wow. I'll, I'll pop it up on the screen. Burr, burr, burr. Oh, some gelato. You, okay, you can okay. see that the package right here. I can snap it like a game. It ain't in there. It's yeah. in there. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Rogue Shop. There's shot. <laughs> Shout out to you for creating a, a work environment that makes people feel comfortable. Like, you- I ain't getting in my car. Like, I'm working. No, no, but I, I, no, no. I'm just like, like tomorrow, I have nowhere to be. And if I did that, you wouldn't be like, you're fire. You'd be like, dude, do some more of that. <laughs> this is a- I'm just saying, you know, like, after it's, it was a long weekend. Yeah. You know. I need something to just chill me out a little bit, create a nice, even playing field. Uh, yeah, rogueshop.com. And I would implore everybody that the, the good stuff right here is not the only thing that they've got. I, I stress that the salve that you can rub on your joints and aches and pains, uh, what it does almost like, not instantly, but man, overnight, you put that stuff on before you go to bed and you wake up and you're just like, man, I, I feel better. And my mom uses it. I've got an uncle that uses it. You know, they're in their sixties and seventies. And like, 
they're using products that they never would have thought they would use before because the idea of like, you know, the, 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 the legal CBD, THC, all of those products demonized, but man, they really do work and uh, they, the quality of life is better with them. Thank you, Richard at Rogue Shop for improving the quality of my life. Promo code orange bloods. So, yeah, so I feel good about the defense. Uh, and I <laughs> just, just finish it up, right? I feel good about the defense and where they're at. I, I definitely, you know, feel good about some of the playmakers at receiver. You know, I, you know, and I, I still will stay on Quinn. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I, you know, jump off that or anything like that effect. You know, consistency, I want to see a little bit more of. Um, and then I think just, I think that the point that you raised, I think catches the most important one, you know, going into, you know, the rest of this year, which is if, if the thing to throw off Sark is saying, throw something at him that he's never seen, well, every coach is going to do that. Like every game, someone's going to throw something different at you. Cause they were like, well, he's only prepared for one thing. And, and he's he's only he's only, he can only hit one shot, and that's let's it. play with nine defensive linemen and just completely freak him out. Correct. Like again, your baseball analogy, it's like <laughs> it's it's kind of like well, if if they know like the hey, I I throw fastballs, you know, then you know they're, they're going to adjust. Like you know, you can throw curves. You, they're going to throw curves and all kinds of different things. It's like you, you can only hit a fastball, so we're going to throw curves. We're going to throw sliders. We're going to do you know different throw motion. So that's that's the thing going forward. Dave Aranda will be a, a good case study for this, right? He is a defensive-minded guy. His team's not that good. But they, they're, they're going to have to slow the ball down. Like The best thing that he can do, Anwar, Dave Aranda on Saturday, forget about the formation that he uses. From a fundamental, like, principle standpoint, if he can get Texas to run its entire offense – through a small portion of the field where they don't have to worry as much about the, the field expanding on them. That is, that's what, forget about like three, three, five or anything like that. If the book on Sark is that you can force him into a, into a box, then you do whatever you got to do to force him into a box. Sarkeesian has to be better than that. Yes. By the way, good morning to you, Barry. I've been waiting. Last two weeks, I've been asking, where is Barry? I haven't seen you in the chats. I don't even know where you're at. And I'm like, I was, it wasn't a call out for anything negative. I'm just like, where is my man? Like, where is he? And I'm glad you are back. I'm glad that you are here. I do want you to stay on your porch every week, though, Barry. You have been on your porch every week for months. I didn't see you for the past couple of weeks. So I'm glad you're back, and I hope you're feeling better, by the way. So good to see you back in the chat. You know, it's All funny right. we're 25% of the season in on war. Yeah. But that's only 15 days. You know, it's like yeah, you're, you're, it's it's 15 days. I mean, it's September. What is that? Eight, what is it? 18th. Is it already the 18th? Okay. So the first game was played on what? The third? The second. So we're 16 days since the start of the season. So yes, we're 25% of the way through, but it's been 16 days. So how much growth, development, improvement can really be made? We're Bad. still in the middle of September. I think everybody just needs to stay as even killed as possible. There are things that this team needs to improve on, but you know, let's get to October 1st and then assess how much improvement has been made. Weirdly enough, though, they'll have played like five games by then. Just, it's a weird, <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a weird yeah. kind of set of expectations that exist, but I feel like everybody on an overreaction Monday, everybody should slow down on the overreactions. Saturday's a big test. Okay. You did that against Wyoming. Now come back on Saturday and just drill Baylor. And then Wyoming is an afterthought. Yes, but I will say this though, catch you, you should do, they should do that. I Kansas in two weeks becomes a very, very, very interesting game for me as far as like a barometer as to when I ask the question, when I and it asks the question, and I start wondering like where is this team? I start thinking, and it's crazy to say because I think you just got to re, we got to readjust our thinking and just 
sometimes teams get good. Like Colorado wasn't good last year. Colorado's good this year, right? Kansas becomes the thing. Like I think those next two weeks before the bye, we get to know more about this team when it's, you know, Kansas at home and then doing, you know, OU, which both teams could be undefeated at that point. So um, what's your last thing? What's your important shot uh, as we get ready to get out of here? Because we got Sark in the next hour and 10 minutes. It's it's simply this. A week ago, Sarkeesian, after the Alabama game, says our identity is to be aggressive. And there were times in that game against Alabama where I didn't agree with the decision-making of going for it on fourth downs. But Sark is like, look, this is who we are. Yeah. Pedal to the metal, all gas, no brakes. And, and I can live with that, right? When he says it like that, it's like, okay, well – that probably means there will be times during the season when he does something in the name of aggressiveness and we got to live with the bad like you live with the good the good produced an Alabama win the thing that happened on Saturday was there was no there was no gas there was just breaks and i think the team played in the mold of its leader and i think they did that against Alabama and then i think weirdly he just talked himself out of being uberly aggressive against Wyoming and I think the team lost a little bit of its edge. I think one of the things that Sark has to learn from that game is this team really does feed off of his mantra and his exhibit, his personal exhibition of the mantra. And when they do that, I think the team plays in unison with that. I think on Saturday we saw an offensive coach become less aggressive. He didn't take his shots. He didn't use all areas of the field. He didn't get the ball to his weapons. Of all the things that can't happen again this year, that's the biggest. And that's my that's my biggest take is that Sark got a freebie. That mess on Saturday happened against a Wyoming team at DKR. Had that happened against OU in Dallas, uh, that happens against BYU at home. Uh. If that happens in Fort Worth and, and TCU figures itself out a little bit. Ah. So Sark, above all else, above all people, is the guy that needed to learn something from Saturday. And here's hoping he did because we're really enjoying this season. And I would hate for it to go off the rails on some stuff that can, I think, be prevented. I'll say this kind of just piggybacking, you know, what you're saying is that to your point, Texas have been very fortunate because because they haven't necessarily played a top notch quarterback yet. I would think they would play place a quarterback that you would consider to be elite, very good, like whatever the case may be. I mean, JT Daniels is a guy. He just is what it is. I mean, you know, Jalen Monroe, Jalen Monroe get, gets benched the following week. Um, and which the jury's still out as far as what he's concerned. Texas plays the backup quarterback this week, last week. They'll play a backup quarterback this upcoming week. Like, that's really fortunate. But they've got the things that they got to figure out because when you play a guy like Jalen Daniels, who's going to be a little bit more effective, then you, how do you, what do you do with that? When you place Dylan Gabriel, for everyone to say about him, he'll be better than the majority of quarterbacks that Texas has faced all year long so far. That's true. So, you know, at the end of the day, whatever you want to say, he's still going to be a good quarterback. You, you can at least say good, you know? And so from that point, so that's where it's like, hey, gotten real fortunate as far as the quarterbacks are concerned, as far as your defense is concerned. But when you get into these things where maybe you start having a track meet and maybe you've got some offenses that are stretch your defense just a little bit, you know, defense is catches it's the defense is giving up 15 point games as an average. It's hard to do that all year long. Like you're you're just gonna have games where guys are figuring you out. And then on the flip side, the offensive side has got to be there in order for Texas to make it out. Uh, last thing, catch. What do you guys got? You got any, do you know what you got for the show today at, at noon? Anything? Nope. All right. Well, good. As soon as, as soon as I'm done, I'll, I'll turn my attention and, and we'll start moving forward. All right. No, 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 no regardless. I do. I, I do know that tomorrow. Oh, one of the all time great Texas players who I never see do media. That's Texas related. I, I he, he's like a ghost, but he returns tomorrow to Orange Bloods Live. The one and only Bryant Westbrook will be on the show. I'm really looking forward to that. 
I got more scheduled for Tuesday at this point on more than I have scheduled for, <laughs> for Monday. Monday. <laughs> well, all right, dude. Well, let me let me schedule my butt down to uh down to uh the to campus. So all right, everybody. Uh I'll be back uh tomorrow. I will do my best not to ask a question that agitates Sark today. I think I'll be all right. Uh ask him I, about the three three five defense and why oh, he sucks yeah. against it. <laughs> oh, I I'm sure, I'm sure Coach, that went over well. The big talk on Twitter right now on orangebloods.com is that you struggle against the 335 defense with that whole three safety thing. Comment. Yeah. And then here's here's what I love about that one, Catch. This is where I'm like, so can people because people in the, over the weekend were like, oh, you should ask them this. And now I'm like, are you guys gonna have my back? What if I ask them <laughs> like that? <laughs> Or you, or you just gonna take a step back like you normally do, and just no matter what the question was, if the coach doesn't, if coach gets gets mad, it was just a dumb question. It was just a dumb question. Like, why'd you ask that? Are you trying to be an agitator? Like, it's always on. Why? Like, people just oh, if they if they still love the coach, they hate when they, it's just like a defender, right? They'll just defend the coach no matter what. That people defended like. In the Alamo Bowl. They hate the media. They yeah, like you, Anwar, as a human being, but at the end of the day, you are in a profession that they hate. Yeah. So they're always – you can – there's just – you're never going to win that, ever. No, no, you'll never win it against a coach. There was, there was people who defended the, uh, the the Alamo Bowl incident, right? The, him yelling at the guy. Like, people defended that. And when it's like, that was that guy's fault. They're like – I said, I mean, can we are we are we ever allowed to say like a coach could have some good behavior? You know, you grab his man boob though, and you just can't okay. do that. that I t- I've gone over that before. I know you did. It's a rule. Yeah. It's a rule. Yeah. You can't put your hands on someone. It's not. It's not. Look, you put it on your shoulder. It's okay. Put it on your man boob. It's not okay. No man wants his man boob touched ever. We're sensitive there. It's like whoa. Whoa, what are you doing? Get in your horse and buggy. You need to go, Anwar. See, <laughs> it's a horse and buggy. Won't go over 50 miles an hour. <laughs> Wish me luck on 183. You guys take care. See you tomorrow. Like I always say, live each day like it's your last. One day it will be. Y'all take care.